Good evening, everyone. For me, oh. it's the good morning. I was listening, Professor Goyo. Wonderful, wonderful presentation with, with all his passion and show beautiful, beautiful case. I want to ask you later about the embolization that the people is using a lot. Um, the next will be Professor Pascal Jabour. Yes, Pascal, Pascal is a one of the greatest neurosurgeons and endovascular in the world. His works in Thomas Jefferson University in Pennsylvania. He will show us the new frontier in neuroendovascular. Maybe some AVM, maybe he will cure some AVM. Maybe Dr. Goyo not like his, some of his presentation. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Professor Jabour is neurosurgeon. And see that you are fighting in the whole world that endovascular has to be made by neurosurgeon, as radio surgery to be made by neurosurgeon. When you have a neurosurgeon talking about neuroendovascular, everybody has to listen and learn and to be involved. Thank you, Professor. Thank you to be with us. Go ahead, please. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. clearly. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the organizers uh, for having me. It's a great pleasure uh, to be talking uh, today. Uh, it's going to be tough uh, uh, to follow uh, uh, Dr. Goel after his uh, flamboyant uh, lecture uh, and uh, great cases. Uh, I want to apologize from whoever doesn't speak Arabic. I want to say Masal khair la azdika nabi Masr u shukran. You know, the relationship uh, between Lebanese and Egyptians is very unique and special. Uh, I, uh, I grew up with my grandmother listening to uh, Um Kulthum. She is one of the greatest Egyptian divas uh, of all time. I also, growing up, used to enjoy the funny movies of Adil Imam, who is one of the greatest uh, comic actors uh, of, of Egypt, too. So uh, those are my disclosures. Uh, I come from Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, this is the neuroscience hospital. So it's a unique model where all neurovascular is done in only one hospital and the rest of the specialties are done in the main building. So here, all we do is uh, neurovascular. So we don't have to compete on any of the uh, infrastructure with anybody else. As you know, Philadelphia is also the city of uh, Rocky. Uh, those are the Rocky Steps and the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. And as you know, Rocky also is respecting social distancing those days and is wearing uh, a mask. Uh, Philadelphia is the birthplace of the Philly cheesesteak. Uh, actually, each time I do an endarterectomy and I look at the plaque that I'm removing, I, it reminds me of the provolone cheese and I always thank those uh, two places for, for providing me with patients, uh, uh, Pat and Gino's in Philadelphia. If you ever visit Philadelphia, please get in touch. I would love to take you there with moderation. This won't hurt you to, ta to taste a nice Philly cheesesteak. So my dear friend Jack is here and uh, I'm gonna talk, you to, uh, talk to you today from a perspective of a mule. And what does this mean? So Jacques always makes fun of us, all the dually trained neurosurgeons and what we call ourselves hybrid neurosurgeons, that hybrid is like the offspring of two, uh, two species. And he would uh, uh, you know, say, you guys are mules. Well, I'm proud to be a mule. If you look, uh, mules are reputed to be more patient and hardly and long living than horses. And they are less obstinate than donkeys. So they get the best of both worlds. Or I can talk to you from a perspective of an I-8, BMW I-8, uh, because uh, this is uh, a car that's better than a Tesla that's completely electric and better than a regular engine car. So it combines also uh, uh, the best of both worlds. 
So uh, uh, Jefferson Hospital for Neuroscience, uh, we have all that. I'm gonna, gonna you know, uh, uh, for the sake of time. And this is a geographically, we are located in an, a, an area that's really heavy density with hospitals and neurovascular centers. And despite that, we were able, able to establish ourselves as a, a big player uh, in, in the area. We started our network in 2009, actually, and we were uh, early adopters of telemedicine. And uh, our uh, mainly goal was to increase accessibility to all patients, uh, regardless of the geographical location. Uh, this is a little bit uh, what I'm talking about, is we have 30, uh, 35 uh, spoke hospitals, and we are the hub, and we have those robots at the hospitals. And it's a little bit like uh, Star Wars here. <laughs> So uh, as you see here, that's the robot, the face-to-face, -face, and then we're talking to the physician, and then you're going to be able to uh, give the recommendation, then we can follow the helicopter all the way until it lands uh, on the roof of, uh, of uh, Jefferson. Uh, this is uh, mainly for stroke, but you know, subarachnoid hemorrhages and everything. So this uh, uh, network... Uh, really was able to uh, provide uh, the standard of care and the cutting edge technology to all the patients in the area. This is a stroke that here is the microcatheter going up and uh, suctioning uh, the clot. So it's also continuity of care because I see the patient on telemedicine, then they come in, I meet them and they say, yeah, we, we saw you earlier uh, on TV. Uh, we published many papers on our uh, tele, tele stroke and uh, uh, experience, and uh, we were actually uh, able to give IVTPA in 97% of eligible patients, and this is an unheard of number. Uh, there were 82% of spoke hospitals reported an increase in the use of TPA, so all good for the patients. So uh, we give IVTPA, you're asking, yes. So maybe we are one of the few places in the country where neurosurgeons give IVTPA. I think uh, the neurosurgeons should step up. All neurosurgeons should step up as a stroke specialist. We need all the forces combined because uh, in 2025, we're gonna have more than 1.2 million strokes a year. Always, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I had uh, a dream to drive an ice cream truck. Well, I could not uh, accomplish my dream, but I, I could drive a truck. But this wasn't a, an ice cream truck. It was a mobile stroke unit. We just celebrated our one year uh, anniversary of the mobile stroke unit. So uh, this is an ambulance with a telemedicine capability and uh, with a CAT scan. And uh, practically uh, this will bringing to curbside uh, all the cutting edge of stroke treatment to the patient. So uh, what happens is there is a stroke, they call 911, and the, uh, hot, well, the ambulance would go and meet the patient curbside. At that time, a CAT scan is done. Uh, I get page, I log on uh, through telemedicine, and I evaluate the patient, and I recommend if the patient uh, needs to get IVTPA or not, and where to bring the patient next if we think the patient is a candidate for an endovascular procedure. We just published our experience with the impact of the mobile stroke unit. As you see here, we were able to streamline all the, the, uh, the, the process between dispatch to scene arrival to CT scan to teleneuro started IVTPA and, and to the hospital. This is the trend of a, the curb to CAT scan trend. So it's going down with time. And uh, this is also very interesting because more and more there's uh, evidence in the literature for direct transfer from the scene of the stroke to the angel suite and bypassing all kinds of other imaging because as you know, time is brain. So more and more we're able with just a CAT scan and if we think from the neurological exam that this patient may have large vessel occlusion high likely, uh, a lot of data in the literature suggests that this patient will be brought directly, and we have been uh, bringing in some patients directly, the patients directly to the angel suite. Uh, we've been pushing envelopes, as you know, with a lot, lot of techn technological advancement, we are able more and more to revascularize uh, vessels and to go more distal. So we published our series of distal mechanical thrombectomies that showed no increased uh, uh, hemorrhage and a, a better outcome. 
uh, more and more we're able to, to open vessels with, with the new uh, devices that we have. For example, this is one of the longest uh, clots that uh, I've removed from a patient. Uh, moving to aneurysms and uh, endovascular treatment uh, for aneurysms, uh, you know, flow diversion, yeah, it may not be an innovation or a new frontier, but it is a disruptive innovation. When flow diversion came out, uh, it was really a, a disruptive innovation because it, it was something di different. And it took us a while to figure out flow diversion and understand it. And like every new technique and technology, people are excited at the beginning. So a lot of people start using flow diversion, it peaked, then, you know, stabilized. And uh, this is uh, a paper I wrote, flow diversion, panacea or poison. I think it's up to us to make it a panacea or to make it a poison. It is very easy to make it a poison, very easy. It's very difficult to make it a panacea. So uh, it's a great tool, but it's not one size fits all. And uh, for example, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a ruptured aneurysm. You know, I like con uh, to be controversial. And I know I have a lot of people here who's uh, really watching me, maybe to attack me at the end, but I'm ready. <laughs> so this is a ruptured aneurysm uh, with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, we did an angiogram, and this patient had this mid-basilar uh, aneurysm. Okay. And at least in my hands, I can say uh, doing an open surgery on this case is uh, difficult. It seems that the whole vessel is diseased. Uh, this is not a blister, but it's uh, like a little bit bigger than, than a blister, but it, it evolves all the, uh, involves all the vessel wall. I think this is an indication where even in ruptured aneurysm, a flow diverter will give you a, a better option. And this is a six months follow up uh, with the aneurysm completely gone and the vessel uh, remodeled. And uh, you know, treatment of uh, aneurysms, blister and blister-like aneurysms, we published our series and, and pipeline is a good option in those cases that are, uh, that are uh, uh, challenging for uh, open surgery. Treating ruptured aneurysms with pipeline, this is also a controversial subject. If you know how to choose your patient, uh, again, there is no taboo. As I said, it's a tailored procedure you definitely, it should be your last resort. Uh, a, a pipeline should not be the first what you think about when you see a ruptured aneurysm. But in, in some cases where no better open surgical option exists, I think pipeline is a, is a good uh, option. Uh, recently, we published our, uh, one of the biggest series of pipeline from a single center, uh, 598 patients, and we looked at predictors of complications, functional outcome, and morbidity. And it's very important to have the insight and it's very important to auto-criticize ourselves and to look back. And now we know more about pipeline. And in my opinion here, what we've learned uh, is I know now when not to use pipeline. Uh, again, we are all humans. We get excited about technology, but it's very important to know when not to use the technique. Like Dr. Goel earlier said, you should know when to run away from an AVM and just not to offer treatment. New generation of flow diversions. This is the FRED device. It's uh, more visible than a pipeline. It can go through more distal and uh, uh, vasculature and tortuosity. Uh, this is a case of a patient that had a, a large uh, pseudoaneurysm at the neck and was presenting with crescendo TIAs even of, on dual, um, uh, dual uh, antiplatelet therapy. I treated this patient with just one FRED device. And uh, this is a six months follow up. Uh, I don't have a perfect result. There's a tiny pseudoaneurysm here, but what, but what I was able to accomplish is uh, reconstruct the vessel and stop the, the, the way for more embolites to go up because those are stents where uh, the, it's not like the old fashioned stent. Those are uh, more dense stents, the flow diverter where uh, the patient cannot embolize from the pseudoaneurysm up intracranially anymore. What about intersecular devices? Uh, the web device is one of them. This is a device where you would go, you place in the aneurysm, you detach it. And we've all seen pictures like this, uh, MCA aneurysms before and after. This is an aneurysm, an MCA aneurysm treated with a web device before and after. Sizing is key. Again, we have early results. We don't know what the long-term result is going to be. We know at least with pipeline and flow diversion that recurrence is unheard of. We have now more than 10 years uh, and we know that with flow diversion, uh, you, you don't have recurrence. But once the aneurysm is gone, once the aneurysm is gone, it's never coming back. But 
it needs to have, you need to have 100% occlusion first. So with, with web, it's still too early to tell. We've seen some encouraging early results, but we don't know the, the long-term results. A recurrence rate, so far we know that there is a recurrence with web. That's why uh, sizing uh, is key. Uh, again, basal tip aneurysm before and after MCA aneurysm. We just uh, published our series of a ruptured aneurysm treated with web. And the web is, is interesting in some of the ruptured aneurysms uh, bifurcating wide neck. Again, I'm going to repeat, not candidate for open surgery. In those cases, if I have the option between putting a device inside the parent vessel, it means putting a stent and doing a Y stenting, for example, uh, as opposed to putting a device just inside the aneurysm uh, without do, uh, using a dual antiplatelet therapy, I'd rather use the web device and not use any uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in ruptured aneurysms and avoid putting uh, uh, hardware in the parent vessel and doing Y stenting or stent uh, assisted coiling. Uh, let's move to a different topic, the dual lumen balloon technique. This is also a, a device, uh, this is a, 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 an improvement or a newer technology in endovascular that uh, helped us treat uh, more uh, dural AV fistulas or uh, AV fistulas and AVMs. Uh, the detachable catheters, so now we have catheters where uh, you would embolize and then it will get detached and then you would leave it there. And then the dual lumen balloon uh, catheters are catheters where you would embolize through the microcatheter while you're occluding the vessel here and avoiding reflux. The major challenges in embolization with liquid embolic is having reflux uh, because you want your, your, your uh, liquid embolic to go forward. If you're treating a fistula, you're not done until you have reflux of liquid embolic in the vein. If the vein, if you don't have reflux in the vein, it means this is going to recur. It means you're not done. In AVMs, again, uh, I believe in, there is a role for, uh, for uh, embolization of AVMs. Uh, for AVMs, you need to have a plan from the beginning. You shouldn't start embolizing just because you can embolize. Just because you have the catheter and the glue, you, sh you, you shouldn't start. You, you need to have the plan from the beginning. So my plan is to do this and that to cure the AVM. If you're not able to cure it, better not to do it. Uh, you shouldn't be adding the risk of embolization on, a, on an AVM, a low-grade AVM in a non-eloquent brain where you can go in or with open surgery and with more direct approach and controlled way, you know, resect the AVM. A lot of a newer technique in embolization, for example, like the pressure cooker technique where you would go, and this is mainly described uh, in, in, uh, in France uh, by René Chapot, uh, where you would go transvenous and transarterial and you would uh, inflate balloons and decrease the flow in the AVM, then you would go from the transvenous way. And it's exactly like a pressure cooker technique, create a closed system and then uh, embolize the AVM. This is, for example, a case where we went transvenous, you have multiple microcatheters, uh, and balloons, and then you have to uh, go, and this is venously, where I'm deploying a coil without detaching it to decrease the flow in the vein. Uh, I'm also inflating a balloon to decrease the flow in the AVM, and then slowly and progressively from the venous side, you start pushing your liquid embolic, and it will go and penetrate the nidus. Again, this is against all the, the teaching that we had, like going through a vein, well, what if you shut down the vein? This is a no-no. So yes, this is why it's very important to screen and choose your patients because if some, for some reason you shut down early the vein, this is a patient where you, you need to go to the OR right away uh, because it's gonna rupture. So this is more progression, this is the, the cast. Uh, AVM Ambo with dual uh, balloon technique. This is a patient that had the chronic subdural at an outside hospital, they drained it, but then turned out to have an AVM uh, and uh, uh, this case was a right-sided temporal AVM. You could argue this is a straightforward open surgical case. I agree. And uh, this is also a, a case where you could embolize it with the dual uh, lumen balloon technique and have a great penetration and go push your liquid embolic into the venous outflow to say that uh, this is cured. Then the, the, the question after and the debate is, do you need to still to resect it or you can watch it? So again, uh, embol cure, curing AVM with embolization, you cannot say that. You can say that angiographically you, you, the AVM is occluded, but you need to have really long follow-up and do long-term angiographic follow-up to say this is a cure. Uh, 
uh, you can say it's secure with, with open surgery, but not yet with, uh, with embolization until you have a long-term uh, follow-up. Dural arteriovenous fistula, we had a nice session with Jacques, with the sessions in, uh, with the University of Miami that he's doing with dural arteriovenous fistulas. Same thing with the balloon dual, uh, dual uh, lumen balloon technique. You're able to inflate the balloon, push your liquid embolic, uh, here, I went through the middle meningeal artery. You're going to see uh, here. So this is a transradial approach. I'm going with my balloon in the, that's the middle meningeal artery all the way. And then I'm going to inflate my balloon for the uh, reflux and then inject my uh, liquid embolic, my onyx, and then I'm going to push it all the way to the fistulous point. It doesn't matter how many feeders is going in, they all converge into a fistulous point. You need to have, that's the liquid embolic being injected. You need to have it all the way. And then you start uh, even crossing the vein and refluxing into the other feeders. This is from the feeders from the occipital artery. This is when you know that you're really done and this fistula is never coming back. And I can say that yes, you can have complete cure of fistulas with embolization as opposed to AVMs. Fistulas can be cured. So as you know, in endovascular, all we do is transfemoral. There have been a, a big push in the last two years with all the complications of the transfemoral approach. This is a paper we published about uh, complications of transfemoral approach. You can have all kinds of complications and complications can be really uh, dangerous. And uh, in randomized control, control trials, we looked at the complication rate, it's around 5.1%. That's why we wanted to think outside the box. Well, not really outside the box, but outside the groin. And uh, we started doing uh, the transradial approach for angiograms and uh, procedures. This paper, when we published it in uh, Stroke, it was uh, the first, uh, the biggest uh, series of transradial approach published at that time from a single center institution, uh, where we looked at all uh, 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 complications of, of the transradial approach. We looked at uh, uh, patients uh, satisfaction uh, where uh, across the board all the patients had, all the patients had really better satisfaction with transradial we sent a questionnaire to patients that had previous transfemoral approach and we asked them to compare they all preferred uh, transradial we even went further to the snuff box uh, this is our uh, one of the uh, a big series of snuff box as you know the anatomical snuff box is here and then we're doing all the diagnostic angiogram from snuff box uh, and the radial is proximal radial is here. The advantages of snuff box is you keep the anatomical position of the patient. You don't need to turn that hand. It's more comfortable. And then if you do your diagnostic angiogram snuff box, you keep the radial here uh, virgin for they, when they come back for the treatment, you can go radial uh, with that. Uh, all those have special inflatable band for after you remove the procedure. This is from our paper uh, showing where, where you're uh, uh, putting the, uh, the sheath. Uh, we also talked about transradial in both extreme ages. This is our most recent paper in transradial when we compared in elderly, and then we published our transradial in kids, in pediatric, in intraarterial chemo for retinoblastoma. It makes sense for babies. This is a case of a baby that I did, because those babies, they keep them sedated for six hours after the procedure, so they don't bend their hip. Uh, and then they go home. So, well, if I'm able to do it transradial, it's much better. Well, it all depends on the size of the radial artery, really small babies, we won't be able to do it. But uh, once it's done, those babies are able to walk home right away. It's much more uh, uh, better for them. This is, for example, a baby, an hour after the procedure is able to walk uh, to, to, to go home. Uh, Intra-arterial chemo for retinoblastoma is considered a new frontier for, uh, for endovascular. Uh, it is a game changer. Those babies used to lose their eyes from retinoblastoma. We are able to avoid enucleation in 80% uh, of the cases uh, and cure this disease. This is, uh, I'm showing you here, uh, where I stopped using a guide catheter to go up. All I do is I use my microcatheter from the groin all the way up. This is my microcatheter, uh, and I'm catheterizing the left side. And then with only the microcatheter, we're going up to the ophthalmic artery. This means it's a very low risk procedure uh, uh, and uh, it's much better tolerated by, by the babies. As you know, in, 
in endovascular procedures, you need to go up with a big guide catheter to do your procedures. That's the basics of endovascular. Here, we're able to avoid that. And then at the end, we're going to put pressure and make sure we're not compressing too much uh, the groin uh, of the baby. And those are results before and after of retinoblastomas, as you see here, completely cured. Really uh, nice to see those babies uh, going back to normal life. What about stroke and transradial? This is another frontier. And this is where if you're, if you're switching uh, and converting your practice uh, from transfemoral to transradial, you should convert stroke at the end because you need to be really comfortable because there's no time to waste in stroke. You cannot afford converting from transradial, from transradial to transfemoral if you, can, you cannot do it. Uh, that's why after you're comfortable with all the procedures at that time, you can convert to stroke. At this point, 100% of my stroke uh, is transradial. This was the last frontier. And uh, again, we have more and more better catheters to be able to do that. It makes perfect sense because those patients with stroke are all uh, with peripheral vascular disease. And the peripheral vascular disease usually has a predilection for the groin. You, you see those patients with really horrible femoral disease, but the radial and, and uh, arteries and subclavian arteries are good. And those patients, the majority, they already got IVTPA. So the risk of having a retroperitoneal hematoma is high. So I'm showing you here a series of combined cases of a lot of tortuosity where really it's difficult to come transfemoral. You see that it's really easy to come transradial, even in distal vessels. This is an M2, M3 occlusion. Uh, so you can bring your guide catheter up uh, and then you can do your procedure. Here it's the left case. As you see here, we hook with a, with a Simmons 2 and then we bring our guide catheter all the way up and then we bring our tools up. And those patients, you can, they can sit up right away. You don't risk any aspiration or anything like that for keeping them flat for four or six hours uh, after that. So uh, uh, we published a, an early paper on transradial approach for acute stroke. We have a paper coming out in Journal of Neurosurgery also where we compared both approaches. And the most important thing is to see if you're taking more time from puncture to recanalization. We are not taking more time is also to see if, you, if there's a longer fluoro time and, and longer uh, uh, radiation dose, but there's no difference. So it is uh, an approach that we should take. We also looked at, at all different devices, all FDA newly approved devices, uh, pipeline, et cetera, all through the transradial approach, and it is feasible. We even started doing intra-op intra angiograms transradial. Uh, uh, it's much better from an ergonomic standpoint. Uh, all my aneurysm clipping, I do an intra-op angiogram, and it, we used to be crowded uh, when we want to do it femoral. And here, this is our uh, paper that we published about intra-op angiogram transfemoral. As you see here, you, it's very easy because you, you stand on the other side. This is the table, that's the CR, and this is the anesthesiologist, so it's uh, much easier. We are duly trained neurosurgeons. You should use uh, all your skills. This is a combined case, a case of a carotid cavernous fistula. We couldn't get to it from any venous side, but this patient had a drainage through the superficial sylvian vein. So what I did is did a, a burr hole, image guided burr hole, and I catheterized the superficial sylvian vein. At that time, I was able to get my microcatheter all the way to the cavernous sinus, and then I was able to treat the fistula that way. There was no other way for me to get to the fistula other than that way. And uh, as you see here, my catheter is going in from the superficial sylvian vein all the way to the cavernous sinus. And that's my angiocath in the superficial sylvian vein. And now I'm injecting my liquid embolic uh, in the CC fistula and the cavernous sinus. That's the cast and this is the fistula. It's completely occluded and here, here it is, all it needed is a, some gel foam, some pressure, and then a burr hole cover, uh, and we're done uh, with the case, and the patient is cured. Uh, we, we published that as a technical note. Supraophthalmic vein approach is another way, if it's uh, available, as if the supraophthalmic vein is available, you would go there, either puncture or uh, open surgery. This is what, where you're going. So uh, you're going through the supraophthalmic vein, insert, inserting your catheter and injecting your uh, liquid embolic. Percutaneous embolization. You shouldn't forget, we shouldn't forget percutaneous embolization. This is a carotid body tumor. 
Uh, sometimes it's better than endovascular embolization. This is a case that uh, I did. I've been doing also a lot of uh, juvenile uh, nasoangiofibroma through that, endoscopically through the nose. As you see here, uh, under ultrasound, I have a balloon in the internal carotid artery to protect it. Then I stick the carotid body tumor. I'm inflating the balloon in the internal carotid, and then I'm going to start injecting my liquid embolic. Uh, in the uh, carotid body tumor. At the end, you have this heavy of a cast, and the case would be uh, really a piece of cake, easy case. Here it is, all with the uh, uh, embolic inside. Carotid blowouts is another uh, uh, frontier. As you know, those are real emergencies, uh, like even more than strokes, where patients with uh, head and neck cancer come and uh, they are bleeding. In a lot of cases, you need to treat this very quickly. A lot of cases, you cannot do a deconstructive procedure. This is a patient that came in, you see the extravasation, had onyx injected, still came back with another bleed with this pseudoaneurysm. So in this case, emergently, we had to put a covered stent. And this is an off-label stent that's usually is a bronchial and biliary stent where you can use it off-label and it will shut down completely the, the bleeding. And this patient is alive because a lot of times those patients... Uh, are cured from that cancer, but they have this carotid blowout from the delayed effect of radiation. So if you can uh, save their lives quickly with that, uh, they, they, gonna, they are fine. Again, surgery is here to stay. Uh, we've published a couple of papers on treated, uh, clipping previously treated endovascular aneurysm. This is a pericallosal stent coiled, recurred. Uh, you can see the strut of the stents here, and then uh, uh, getting clipped. Uh, Sometimes uh, acutely sick patients, you can treat them endovascularly. We do it all the time. Six months follow up, if there's a recurrence, we will have a low threshold to clip them doing the gold standard definitive treatment. It's, it's good to be able to do both. It's good to be able to be objective and choose the best uh, for the patient. Uh, sometimes you don't even have time to do an angiogram. This is a case that presented. Uh, uh, with the massive hemorrhage, antiparenchymal hemorrhage, MCA aneurysm. Well, in this case, I don't have a choice. It's not like end or open. This is a definitely an open case uh, where I took the patient and just, you know, clipped the aneurysm, uh, opened the MCA. You see, I opened the MCA aneurysm here. Uh, and then uh, uh, this is the temporary clipping that I'm removing. This patient needed to go to the OR without any uh, further delays. Another case uh, of a patient that presented, this is the same week I got those two patients, large PCOM aneurysm, uh, again, from CTA to operating room. This was during COVID time. One of those patients, this one, had COVID and ruptured the aneurysm after a big fit of cough. So as you see here, a decompression, then going down, a temporary clip on the ICA, then clipping the PCOM aneurysm. Uh, and this is the uh, intraop angiogram. Uh, and complete occlusion of the aneurysm. Uh, bypass surgery should not become a lost art. This is a patient that had an invasion of the cavernous sinus with aspergillosis, the presenting with crescendo TIAs. Again, uh, uh, previous, uh, uh, you, you've seen previous lecture about uh, uh, bypass. Uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't do a lot of bypasses, but if it's needed, I'm able to do it. So uh, as I said, should not become a lost art. Uh, you've seen much uh, nicer presentation before me, so I'm going to go quickly on that. Giant aneurysm, again, uh, in those cases, uh, an aneurysm, giant aneurysm, I'm doing the decompression, suction decompression technique. So in, again, those cases, endovascular is not the option when you need to uh, decompress. So uh, again, I think you should, we should never advertise for a tool. Uh, not for an endovascular tool and not for a surgical tool. We should advertise for a disease. We are here, we are competent in both, and we are here to treat aneurysms. We are not here to clip aneurysms. We are not here to coil aneurysms. We are here to just take care of uh, aneurysms. And sometimes it's very important to look from different angles, and from a different angle, you're going to see different things. Well, when you look at that, it's, wow, you are horrified. But then when you look again, well, you see other information. So what have we accomplished so far in endovascular? We have accomplished a lot of things. But one area of uncharted waters is, to, is about to be explored, and this is remote interventions and remote stroke interventions. So you're all familiar with those famous robots. What I'm going to be talking about is a different robot. It's the endovascular robot. 
So uh, this is uh, something that we just started before the, uh, the, the COVID pandemic. We uh, uh, brought our, the new uh, neuroendovascular robot. This is the uh, station where the surgeon would sit and work, which would be outside. And then this is the robot. It's the robotic arm in the angio suite. And uh, procedures are done uh, while the surgeon is in the control room. Uh, I'm gonna go quickly for the sake of time. So this is how we're prepping the robot. Uh, very easy and quickly. This is the cassette that you place. And uh, it has uh, very user friendly and it has all those uh, uh, windows you open and you insert your catheters, micro catheters. And this uh, will let you uh, later on go out and do your procedures. So you're, we're hooking it to the radial sheath. Keep on doing here. This is a diagnostic angiograms uh, done with the robot. Is, I'm in the control room. I'm, I'm shaping my Simmons catheter. I'm catheterizing all that. A lot of advantages in this. First of all, radiation exposure. Second, ergonomically, you don't have to wear lead. Uh, third, it has more precise movements of the microwire. So if you're going through, it's really severe uh, stenosis of the carotid with the microwire. You can manipulate the wire, you can torque the wire much better. And then the future application of this is uh, hopefully uh, when it's FDA approved, remote stroke intervention for those patients that cannot get to a comprehensive stroke center really quickly, you can uh, maybe do a remote, remote stro stroke intervention. Another advantage of this, well, we learned that after the pandemic is you don't have to be in the same patient of a, of a patient that may, be, may have COVID and you can sit outside, so protection of your, uh, uh, of your uh, team. This is a case of a, a bad carotid stenosis, a really high level stenosis and post-radiation stenosis. So uh, carotid endarterectomy is not an option here. And uh, this was a case where I did it with, uh, with uh, robotically. I was able to navigate my microwire. I'm doing it here uh, robotically through the stenosis. Then I'm going to bring up my uh, balloon. And this is the balloon uh, being brought up. This is the protection device, actually. This is what's happening in the room while I'm manipulating all the devices. And this is the balloon inflation that you're going to see here. And this is the stent uh, deployment, and this is the final result. We had uh, published uh, the feasibility and proof of principle of the robotic uh, angiograms and the uh, carotid stents. And it's really exciting for the new generation or interventions to be uh, trained on this uh, robot. We just published in Journal of Neurosurgery uh, a, a comparison between manual versus robotic. Again, same idea like we talked about transradial. We wanted to prove that you're not having more radiation exposure, you're not using more contrast, and you're not having more fluoro time. What we had, one difference is the time of the procedure is a little bit longer because it's a learning curve. It takes time to drape the robot and do all those things, but it did not translate into an increase in fluoro time or radiation exposure. So we were doing all those exciting stuff until this little creature invaded our world. And we started seeing uh, uh, those uh, creatures going to the supermarket and buying uh, really all the toilet papers that they can find. Uh, it was a new reality seeing in our hospitals that we are uh, recycling masks. That was, as you know, a big, uh, you know, uh, crash uh, of the market. And little things used to make us happy. I used to wait a week to get uh, what's inside this bag. What do you think is inside this bag? Well, it's a really precious N95 mask that I had to use for a full week. Uh, so this is a little bit some uh, contrast, right? I'm showing you the best and the newest technologies and neuroendovascular robotic in, on one slide. And on the next slide, I'm telling you, well, we don't have enough uh, PPEs. We don't have enough N95. I have to use my N95 for a week. So we weren't prepared for this pandemic. And then we started seeing more and more young patients presenting with stroke. And then all the stroke treatment became a new uh, uh, algorithm and, uh, and then a new uh, a reality where we have to uh, get geared up, uh, we have to waste time to put uh, all our protection device. So there's a new now ritual in doing all things and it will affect, uh, you know, patient's care. Uh, 
started doing clinics from home. Uh, actually, it's easy because all you have to worry about is from the waist up. So here, here I'm in at home doing, doing uh, seeing patients, but no one cares what I look like uh, underneath. Uh, Residency during COVID is also uh, challenging. Uh, we had to make sure that our residents are protected and our residents are getting the education they, they need. And then uh, we published one of the first papers of uh, linking uh, COVID with uh, strokes in young patients with no risk factors. We realized that there are a lot of patients that were young, a lot of patients with no risk factors that are presenting with strokes. Most important is in 50% of them, stroke was the first symptom of COVID. Despite the fact that we were able to have good angiographic results, these patients ended up having a higher mortality and those cases took longer time. So it was more stubborn clots. And why? There are different mechanisms. I'm not going to go into them, but there are different uh, mechanisms how, how this can happen. This drew the attention of national TV and all, all the uh, newspapers. And then we published another paper in the International Journal of Stroke confirming the same thing. This is another uh, paper in Journal of Neurosurgery about venous diseases and COVID patients. And another case that came in with monocular visual loss presenting uh, as the first symptom of COVID. A patient who, with no risk factors, developed a central retinal artery occlusion and had a floating thrombus in the ICA, and only risk factor was COVID. Another one, uh, about in two patients, we had access to the CSF and we sent it, but we couldn't find COVID in the CF, CSF, but they were COVID positive. So this is more in favor of a, not a direct invasion of the brain, but possibly vascular. Another international comp contribution that we did with uh, multiple centers showing that uh, COVID patients with stroke have a uh, worse outcome. I think it's time for neurosurgery to learn from airline industry. And what I mean by that is to double check, triple check, and to do a lot of simulation. Uh, we do it uh, all the time with our residents. This is uh, uh, a, a pre-sigmoid approach physical model that uh, uh, we started doing at Jefferson where the residents will start drilling. And then if they hit the sinus, it's gonna give you a beep. If they hit the facial nerve, it's give you another beep. It will time them if you hit the dura. So simulation and, uh, and, and physical models are really important. Uh, this is uh, one of the courses that I do for the residents of, with our endovascular simulator and with, with flow models. Uh, knowledge is tricky. There are things we know that we know fine. There are things we know that we don't know. This is where we need to improve. There are things we don't know that we know. This is a bonus. But the most important thing is there are a lot of things that we don't know that we don't know. And this is ignorance. And we all need to work on our ignorance because we are all ignorant. And until we figure out that and we acknowledge that, our patients are going to still uh, suffer. I talked about a lot of devices in my lecture. And uh, it's, the, it's a match between you and the device. It's like dating. It's like match.com. It's very important to get to know each other, you and the device. It's very important to anticipate the reaction to your action. It's very important to learn to avoid embarrassing situation. It's exactly like dating. And uh, it's very important to know what to expect from the device. Uh, avoid pushing to a nervous breakdown. You can do that in relationships and in, in, in a surgery. And some wounds are not repairable. So again, it's not a debate. It's not a competition. It's those all are complementary techniques. Open surgery is here to stay, but you should stay open-minded, do tailored procedure, avoid one size fits all, embrace new technology. That's very important to embrace new technology. And remember, dinosaurs disappeared because they couldn't adapt to new conditions. Whatever you do, follow the rules. Don't do like this guy that's really breaking every single rule. And remember that always there's, other than the patients and you need to take care of patients, there's someone always watching you, especially uh, in the US. I want to take a minute to acknowledge all my previous research fellows. They are now all neurosurgery residents. One of them is my current one, Ahmad Swade. He's a real star who's published this year more than 50 papers. This is a, a, a publication in neurosurgery uh, that we didn't do it. It was from a different center where they looked at the neurosurgery residents output in academic in neurosurgery in the U.S. And Jefferson, our program was the first uh, in the country. Emma. I'm going to finish with that. Emma. 
Emma. Emma. Emma. So technology can be a double-edged sword. Thank you. Okay, Sam. <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. I don't know. It, it's you, the Professor Boba. Yeah, I'm here. I don't know if if you can can see me. Can yes, we can see you. Me. Yeah, I see, I see that Doctor Mark is already right there. But ask me to start a very short discussion about. Professor Tu presentation, Professor Go presentation, and the wonderful presentation of uh, Dr. Gabur. Really tell that the technology is improving every day. In the endovascular, the future of endovascular, nobody knows that every day, every day you have a new thing coming. But still, today you have a lot of questions about the technology, about the surgical procedures, especially in AVN. Dr. Goyo, are you here? He's not here. Yes, he yes, here? yes, I'm here, okay, yes, my... yes, yes. We just saw, we just saw a wonderful presentation of Professor Jabu. Yes, yes. Some wonderful. AVM that can go there in cure. Why you don't like Preoperative embolization. Why don't give a chance to this guy to cure the guy to cure the AVM without open their head? <laughs> no, no, that is not. You know how many? You, Doctor Jabur, will answer how many AVMs can be cured by embolization. Doctor Jabur, can you answer that question? Uh, rarely, actually, small number is cured. And again, as I said, I cannot say cure until I have a really long-term follow-up. Now, I can yes. challenge people that don't believe in cure with embolization that I have some, again, some 10-year follow-up angiogram. This, I think everyone agrees that's an, an embolic, it's a cure. That's a cure with embolization. If you have a 10-year follow-up angiogram, I mean, that's a cure. But again, if you want to talk how many are cured, uh, with embolization alone, oh yeah, I agree with Dr. Gowen, not a lot. You know what, uh, Louis? Many people, many people pushing a lot in stroke, in aneurysm, but they are not pushing a lot the technology for treat AVM endovascular. It's the companies, the industry is not involved in it, it's not a good business, or the AVM is much more difficult to treat than the stroke. Than, and why is not improving the treatment and the endovascular treatment of AVM? So, so you know, we, we don't like Aruba, but I think Aruba was a wake-up call, especially for, uh, for endovascular. You know, it really showed people that you can hurt people when you don't have a plan, when you're not sure what you're doing. You, you can hurt people. And sometimes... As we saw, you know, even with, with the biggest surgeons, open surgeons like Dr. Goel and Dr. Morcos, they would look at NAVM and say, you know what, I'm not touching this because I cannot beat the natural history of the disease. In anything you do, if you cannot beat the natural history of the disease, you shouldn't be offering treatment. Now, endovascular treatment with AVMs, it, it improved. It didn't, there's not a lot of improvements as compared to aneurysms, but you know, there are a lot of stuff. And if you look at old series of, of embolization and new series, well, the, there's less complication rates with the new series. And you are able to have an angiographic occlusion more than before. With Onyx compared to NBCA, you have more angiographic occlusions. Uh, and then with the balloon, dual balloon technique, you're able to treat more. So uh, not enough improvement but but there are some but again the most important thing is you need to have a plan not because i am able to inject some glue i should go ahead and inject some glue and treat all comers and if i think that you know what open surgery is straightforward i don't need even to go through embolization i would go and resect it dr goyo 
you see the most the most important thing is if you see avm and if you can resect it with confidence that is the best you even the most you know the most experienced embolization people will tell you that they if you can do it with confidence i don't want to put so much glue and all those thing on x and all it makes a huge cast and the avm is still there so if you can resect that is the best there is no question no nobody no even endovascular people will say if you can resect that is the best but can you resect that is the question dr marcus no no the aruba was a very controversy paper everybody was going to say that seems wrong but now new data are coming then they are showing our very similar result aruba was very poorly done uh, borba it gave us one good thing uh, well several good things actually uh, as pascal said earlier it showed that partial treatment is worthless and even harmful but it reconfirmed the natural history of untreated avm the medical group the control group had uh, essentially almost exactly 2.4 per percent bleed rate per year in untreated avm so so we can thank them for reconfirming what we already know you know there was a 10.2% morbidity after 33 months from the untreated avm that in itself is very important information uh people like jacques moret as as you know big big endovascular people himself has told me and changed his practice about about avm embolization he does not treat unruptured avm endovascularly because he agrees that the risk of embolization is not justified at least in unruptured avm that's not the same story for him for ruptured uh, avm um and you know no two avms are alike i mean a tool was showing us you know we all you know use spetzler martin classification which is of course completely irrelevant for endovascular treatment even if you supplemented with the lawton young supplementary scale improves it a little bit but not two avms are alike and individualized treatment is key and um you know that's that's important to say one last thing i will say there are people who can cure avm endovascularly valavanis did it many years ago even yazargil would tell you that valavanis through his superb understanding of the angio architecture of some avms in his old paper was about 40% now that's not 40% cure rate of all avms but the ones he knew he could do and he chose to do it and was able to do it in 40% so you know we have to keep as again like in fistula if you can occlude the vein endovascularly before you uh, you know before you rupture the avm you will achieve an endovascular cure uh, but it is very rare in the us for sure now it's not a trend to try to do it endovascularly be because it's actually quite hard and requires that top 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 uh, dedication to do it well very select case very select case but there is a, a a third player in this avm business is the radio surgery when you indicate you believe that the radio surgery will be the best treatment for uh, avm dr jabour pascal you're yeah. muted yeah yeah so uh, yeah so in my practice um, i i do radio surgery in cases uh, where i definitely want to treat the avm but there's no open surgical option or endovascular option for that my last resort would be for radio surgery so first i need to decide that yes this avm needs to be treated for some reason or the other and if i don't have uh, any other option at that time radio surgery i try to avoid radio surgery in ruptured avms because as you know it's going to leave the patient unprotected for at least 3 years 
And then I tried to avoid radiosurgery in previously embolized AVM because we know from all the Pittsburgh data that they're going to have a lower uh, response. At all. When you send the yes. big AVM to radiosurgery, never, huh? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. See, I have told you, no, I'll tell you, I'll answer that question. See, there are some AVMs which are not safe for surgery, completely not safe and should not be done. But even in those cases, sometimes I like to have some kind of like, if there are some internal aneurysms or some kind of feeders you can selectively block I think I still use very rarely in these kind of cases to do some uh, targeted embolization. And if even embolization is, you know, if it is not, uh, I rarely send these patients for uh, gamma knife or radiation treatment. Sometimes, very rarely. If the patient is very heavily symptomatic and there is no surgery and there is no other treatment, embolization can even help and have been reported that even large AVMs can be helped if not cured by uh, radiation. So there is a role. I will not say there is no role because some of these patients can be very heavily symptomatic. If, and if you are saying I cannot operate, then something has to be done. So radiation can be helpful in these situations. And even embolization can be helpful in these situations. I think you have time for one question. I, uh, I don't know if Dr. Bing Shu want to say something or Professor Marcus. No, I, th I think Sam wants us to stop the discussion and proceed. Yes, I yes, see yes, it in yes, the yes. chat box. Yes, yes. And Bing Shu yes. hopefully is asleep in his bed. It's middle of the night in China. <laughs> I'm here. Oh, you're still up. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my actually, goodness. Still there, uh, still there. See. I, I, he I waiting for you. I agree with uh, uh, Professor Ko. Uh, personally, I resect the AVM directly without the preoperative uh, implantation. But uh, I do notice that some new uh, young uh, neurosurgeon, and uh, uh, if you did the preoperative uh, implantation, actually uh, it makes the uh, young neurosurgeon more confident to treat the uh, AVM and uh, actually. It's uh, uh, helpful, uh, gives them more confident. Uh, that's very important. Actually, technically, I don't think the hardcore uh, in the AVM can help uh, for the resection. Actually, sometimes if the uh, big cast of the onyx may, uh, can make the uh, resection um, more difficult. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for our 